my mute, but welcome everyone. I'd love to, uh, we're gonna kick off the TCLP webinar right now. Really excited to have you here today. Uh, the focus of this webinar is transformational change concepts and frameworks um, and how they're evolving. Uh, I'd like to introduce Anna Williams to kick us off and review the uh, agenda and purpose for the webinar today. Anna is an independent strategic learning expert uh, who many of you know. Um, who works with many large organizations to increase the influence and impact of their work. But since 2013, she's helped the SIF become a more strategic learning organization, first by helping design the SIF's evaluation and learning initiative, and then by conceptualizing and launching this transformational change learning partnership, which she's been guiding ever since. So it's uh, exciting to welcome Anna to kick us off today. Thank you, Tim, and welcome to everybody. I know it's early morning for some of us and afternoon or evening for others. Uh, glad you could join us today for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to introduce Tim Larson, who was just speaking for those of you who don't know him. Uh, Tim is the lead facilitator for the TCLP's facilitation team. We have other uh, facilitation team members helping today as well. And Tim is also president of Ross Strategic, where he's worked for, I think, around 20 years. And for about 15 of those, has worked a lot in the arenas of climate change, evaluation, and learning. He was also part of the teams that worked in 2017 and 2018 on the TCLP as part of the evaluation team and the facilitated learning team. So we're very pleased to have team with, uh, Tim with us this year in his role as facilitator. I'd like to just remind people to please mute their lines when you're not speaking. Uh, you can uh, do that either on your phone or on the mute function through WebEx. Uh, we are recording the webinar today. Uh, this particular webinar we hope to use as a reference for people who aren't familiar with this work or these concepts and frameworks. And we'll have it available soon on the SIF website, and uh, people will be able to come and learn about these on their own time if they choose to do so. Uh, that's the intent of recording this webinar today. Uh, we do want to encourage you to use the chat function in WebEx to ask questions. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself that way as well. And also to raise your hand using the hand icon next to your name in the participant list. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question um, and the facilitators will be tracking both the chat and the hand raising uh, during the times when we have some moments to both ask questions and to, to talk. Okay, well, before we move on, I'd just like to reiterate the purpose of today's webinar. Uh, we have shared the transformational change learning partnership concepts and frameworks a number of times, both in writing and in presentations. Uh, however, we've done it very quickly. And what we've realized over time is that uh, sometimes they're not fully understood uh, or the intent behind uh, you know, some of them is not fleshed out enough that people can understand them and then use them for their own purposes. And furthermore, we've realized that a number of these uh, concepts and frameworks also have their own limitations or drawbacks, perhaps gaps, and we're evolving them for that reason. We've known that they needed to advance or evolve in certain ways for a while, but this is the time in the year when we're working with many of you actually to do that. We're excited about that advancement. So we'll be covering some of that also in the webinar today, and we'll provide information about other opportunities, particularly through the interest group focused on these topics, concepts, methods, and metrics, which is engaging more deeply in the advancement process through a deliberative uh, you know, uh, conversation uh, process and input from those of you who might want to join that particular effort, dive more deeply into this. Uh, we're going to be first covering a little bit of the Transformational Change Learning Partnership business, some activities that are happening with the TCLP. Uh, I'll be handing it over to Regan Smirthwaite, who works with me on the TCLP. And Regan is an emerging evaluator who's been working with SIF and the TCLP since late last year. 
And prior to joining us with the TCLP, she was working on issues related to international development in South Asia. Many of you have heard from her, but um, we're excited to have her engaging today on the webinar and just the partnership she's brought with the TCLP, I'm very grateful for. And then we'll be talking about uh, the frameworks uh, in order of the definition, the four dimensions, and then uh, both stages and signals. Uh, the arenas of intervention we're also going to cover. So we'll be handing it to a number of our colleagues who will be introduced in turn for that. We will stop and pause for a few Q&A type of moments and as much discussion as we can. Uh, so let's see, I think I've covered everything there. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Regan to cover some of the upcoming TCLP business. Thank you, Regan. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, yes, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'm going to quickly run through uh, some TCLP business before we get started. Um, first, we just wanted to remind you about the TCLP interest groups, which are active. Um, the uh, Landscapes group is having its launch meeting tomorrow, and other groups are meeting at um, various times throughout August um, and September. So um, if you are interested in joining an interest group related to uh, landscapes and forests, transformational change concepts, resilience, or clean energy, um, please reach out so we can add you to those distribution lists um, because those groups are starting to meet. And um, we have a really exciting uh, lineup of discussions um, for the rest of the year. Um, we also are planning a webinar um, that's TCLP-wide for September. Um, we'll send out the dates for that when we have them. Um, but we're having speakers from Earthworm to talk about uh, the private sector, so we're really excited about that. Um, I wanted to remind you that we have um, published a TCLP webpage on the SIF website, um, which has links to the TCLP um, short video that some of you may have seen various iterations of earlier this year, um, as well as information about upcoming webinars, uh, previous webinar recordings, and soon interest group updates. Um, finally, I want to uh, let you all know that uh, we are currently um, hiring. There is a job description posted on the World Bank Jobs website, um, which you can find in the link that was sent out through, um, through MailChimp this morning. Um, and we'll send out the uh, presentation again so you can have that link after this presentation has concluded. So with that, um, I will hand it back to Tim. Great, thank you, Regan. Um, uh, now we're actually gonna turn and dive into the transformational change framework. Uh, we think it's really helpful to have a grounded understanding of what was developed um, to really equip folks to you know, work with the TCLP in updating and revising that. And to kick us off there, I'd like to turn to uh, Joe Dickman, um, to talk more about the history of thinking about transformational change. Joe's worked in the evaluation sector for nearly 20 years, working with nonprofit, international philanthropic and government organizations. Many of you know him. Uh, he's worked with organizations including CARE, Mercy Corps, MasterCard Foundation, the World Bank, and various NGOs. But importantly, for the last four years, Joe's led CIF's evaluation and learning initiative and has been thinking a lot about transformational change in that context. So Joe, take it away. Great, thank you, Tim, and hello, everyone. Uh, good to see so many names here. Um, well, just to give a little bit of context, um, as many of you know, uh, SIF was founded in 2008 and articulated a, a goal of transformation towards low carbon, climate resilient uh, development pathways. And you can see here in the slide that different SIF programs articulated this in different ways. Um, so the Clean Technology Fund, the Scaling Re Renewable Energy in Low-Income Countries, SREP, the Pilot Program for Climate Resilience, and the Forest Investment Program, uh, the FIP, all 
had transformation as part of their uh, vision and goal statements, either implicitly or explicitly. Um, and so uh, other, you know, this has always been central to the CIF's uh, DNA, I, I think, uh, since it was founded, and this has influenced uh, the way that uh, programs have been thought about and designed as, as verified in the transformational change uh, evaluations. Um, and then other climate finance institutions as well uh, often have this or some version of transformational change as an overarching goal. And so when we started the evaluation and learning initiative a few years ago, we did widespread uh, consultations uh, across the CIS community as well as with other uh, uh, external actors and organizations. Um, and together with the advisory group, we came up with these four themes that you see on the slide. Uh, however, transformational change was far and away the number one thing that most people wanted to uh, better understand and assess uh, SIP's contributions to through the work of the ENL initiative. And so we always saw it as a kind of umbrella theme that tied all of the others together uh, uh, and, and was mainstreamed uh, uh, across activities that we did in the other themes, as well as had its own standalone uh, uh, activities. And we should also add, uh, we now have additional learning themes around development impacts of climate finance, just transition, and other sector uh, and program specific priorities. Um, I wanna now turn to Nasibe Chamor, who's uh, been a member of the TCLP uh, for several years. And uh, she'll talk about th that work and its work to develop the framework and concepts uh, Nasibe is a Mexican uh, citizen and an internationalist with experience in forest and climate change initiatives and is currently working as an environmental consultant with Ross Strategic as part of the TCLP facilitation uh, team and is facilitating the landscapes interest groups uh, in, interest group in particular. Uh, I should also mention from 2009 to 2019, she worked at Mexico's National Forestry Commission, CONAFOR, where she participated in the design and implementation of uh, Mexico's investment plan under the CIF and had several roles within the CIF community, uh, including chairing uh, trust fund committees for a period of time. Uh, so Nasibe, uh, over to you. Thanks, thanks Joe. Um, hi everyone, it's really nice to see such a great turnout. Um, yeah, well, as Joe mentioned, um, this has been an ongoing process. Uh, the CIF Evaluation and Learning Initiative launched the Transformational Change Learning Partnership, or TCLP, as we know it, uh, in 2017, uh, mainly to react to a demand from stakeholders um, that were looking for a clearer understanding on transformational change and what the CIF role was in supporting this transformational change over its first 10 years of operation. So the TCLP engaged more than 80 stakeholders that range from multilateral development banks, seed donor countries, recipient countries, other climate finance institutions, um, civil society organizations, and they were all looking to address questions on what transformational change means, um, what were the main CIF contributions to transformational change through its design and implementation, and which were the lessons that people could learn from the CIF experience. Um, and these les lessons ideally would be mainstreamed not only within the CIF, but also across other initiatives um, in order to improve the contributions of international climate finance to transformational change uh, going forward. And it was actually during that time, as Joe mentioned, that I was participating in the PCLP initiative, uh, representing the government of Mexico and sharing our experience uh, from our work, mainly within the forest investment program. Um, as a member of the TCLP, we met uh, in a series of workshops in 2017 in order to develop the transformational change framework and concepts. The working draft concepts were further refined, they were added to, and they were tested during 2018 and early 2019 by uh, a team from consultants from ITEC that used the framework to structure an evaluation of the CIV and its contributions to transformational change. Also, the Overseas Development Institute used this framework to guide its um, 
evidence synthesis related to transformational change in the shift and climate climate. Um, so all this work during a couple of years, and right now we are uh, presenting the framework and concept, and also helping to launch efforts to further, further evolve and improve this framework and these concepts. Um, in 2020, the TCLP has entered a new phase, launching several interest groups to further exploration of transformational change in the context of climate action. One of the interest groups, which is called the Concepts, Methods and Metrics, or CMM, uh, is dedicated to clarifying, to advancing and evolving the TCLP transformational change framework and concepts, and this is what we are discussing today. Um, before presenting this framework and concepts, and um, Regan, would you mind going to the next slide, please? Thanks. Uh, oh, the one before. Thanks. So before presenting these framework and concepts, uh, we want to acknowledge the remarkable work that TCLP participants uh, have done in contributing during 2017, 2018, and 2019 to develop a number of concepts and frameworks to better understand transformational change and to recognize, of course, the work of many others that the TCLP has drawn on. Uh, the TCLP concepts and frameworks included, first, a definition of what is transformational change, and of course, this is a work in progress. It also included four dimensions of transformational change, uh, nine arenas of intervention, and uh, stages of advancement towards transformation, and also a preliminary set of signals uh, on how to identify transformational change. And finally, it also developed, we also developed um, a series of overarching theories and hypotheses for how transformational change happens, grounded in the CIV's own approach to realizing transformation. Today, we're going to focus on some of these, uh, the ones that have found to be useful and thus far um, mostly mentioned. We also want to acknowledge that we view the TCLP transformational change framework and, con and concepts as a work in progress. And although we are very proud of the results, we know there are other approaches and other concepts and frame framing that are also very, very useful. Um, we have observed that this has proven to be a useful framework for thinking about transformational change in the context of, of safe and climate action. And at the same time, uh, TCLP discussions have highlighted a variety of gaps and limitations of the current TCLP uh, framework and concepts. We will share some of them during this webinar, uh, but we also encourage uh, all of you to bring our, to our attention other gaps that you might find. Finally, over the next six months, we see that an important goal of the TCLP's work, especially through the concepts, methods, and metrics interest group, PMM, uh, one important goal is to strengthen and improve the TCLP transformational change uh, framework and concepts. And we see several different ways on how to address this goal. First is to attend to the gaps that we mentioned and advance uh, new concepts in the TCLP framework. Also, we want to make changes to clarify and to uh, strengthen the framework or the individual concepts. We also want to support uh, that the framework and the concepts are disseminated and of course used. And finally, we want to advance the compatibility and alignment of the TCLP framework with other frameworks, uh, other tools and other concepts that might be developed through other initiatives. Um, now we would like to present the TCLP framework and concepts. And I will start by uh, presenting the working definition. This is a brief overview of the concept. Uh, TCLP identified a working definition of transformational change in climate action, and it is as follows. It's the um, strategic changes in targeted markets and other systems with large-scale sustainable impacts that shift 
and or accelerate the trajectory toward low carbon and climate resilient development. Now, a few comments on how this working definition came to life. First, in 2017, uh, the TCLP explored existing definitions to draw from and to inform to create its own definition. So after that, there were some discussions among uh, TCLP about whether a definition was needed, if it was useful, or if even it was possible to create one. And then after some months of discussion and debate, the TCLP settled on this working definition, which of course drew from language used by the CIF in its uh, base documents, for example, low carbon, uh, climate resilient development uh, specifically. And the concept of the four dimensions of transformational change, which will be covered shortly. Um, perhaps this definition didn't go as far as some would want. For example, uh, they're using low carbon instead of no carbon uh, or tying to Paris Agreement targets or sustainable development goals. And it was viewed as a working definition to meet the TCLP's immediate mandate and scope with the possibility to be improved and updated later in time. And that's where we are now. Uh, some observations uh, around its value. Um, this working definition was very useful because it provided a practical way of thinking about transformational change in the safe context. Uh, it truly helped to ground the analytical work that was undertaken during 2018. Uh, however, we also uh, recognize that it has some limitations. Uh, for example, the definition is focused mainly on CIF work. It includes, um, it uses CIF terms uh, from its founding documents that were developed in 2008 sorry, or 2009. So, of course, this language could be updated. And related to this, uh, we also see that this working definition is not particularly strong in terms of the ultimate global goal in limited, uh, limiting GHG emissions and warming to a particular level, for example, or about the role of fundamental principles, including equity and just transition. Um, other considerations, for example, may relate to the working definition are covered under reflections on the dimensions of transformational change. Um, and to talk about these uh, dimensions of transformational change, I want to uh, give the word to Anna Williams, which uh, was introduced by Tim, uh, to talk about this. Thanks, Masive. Uh, you covered a lot of territory there and really appreciate that. And um, the working definition that the TCLP came up with in 2017 is a good example of a uh, definition that was uh, for a particular purpose uh, at that time and was useful for that. But uh, going forward, we recognize that uh, a definition of transformational change or maybe a number of them uh, might be more useful. Uh, so it's a, it's a good you know, illustrative example of how things are evolving. Uh, we do have several other frameworks. I'm going to cover uh, the four dimensions of transformational change that the TCLP worked on in 2017 and 2018, and we're evolving now. Uh, my colleagues will be taking over after me to share a few other frameworks. And I'll just note, we do have some broader theories uh, that theories of transformational change and hypotheses and a few other things that we're not going into in depth today, but that have been attempts to bring it all together. Uh, I think Tim Larson will mention those too, but um, we are aware that some overarching uh, sort of landscape views that put these different components together would be very useful and we'd be eager to advance those this year as well. On the dimensions, so the dimensions really are the first uh, attempt that we've made uh, fairly, I think, effectively to really make transformational change real. Uh, that's obviously fundamental to a concept as big and often as vague as transformational change. Uh, and what we did is uh, looked really around at how other people were conceptualizing this and um, what, what frameworks they were using. And the one that, that resonated the most that we built upon was uh, some work done by the World Bank's Independent Evaluation Group on transformational engagements. And they, they had four dimensions very similar to this 
that have been picked up by other uh, climate finance institutions and and others. And through the TCLP and a deliberative process, we evolved them some to fit the TCLP's own sort of view and purpose and uh, came up with the four that I'll run through, including some of their current sort of clarity needs and limitations and opportunities for improvement. So the four dimensions are uh, relevance, um, systemic change, scale, and sustainability. I'll walk through them because they're not each or all as obvious as they may seem. We're also going to be considering uh, how these can be used uh, and some limitations and how they might be used or interpreted. Um, maybe a, a few pitfalls that that we could all fall into if we don't use them as as intended or perhaps as appropriate given the their uh, meaning. Okay, so next slide on on uh, the first dimension relevance. Well, this sounds really obvious, and in some ways it is, but this really is relevance about the really strategic focus and design of a change initiative or movement, not just relevance to a topic like climate change or you know it could be global health, but something that's different than the business as usual or the pure incremental you know project by project approach that hasn't really over time shown to catalyze, advance, or achieve the big systems change that we all recognize is needed in this case in the context of climate change plus. Relevance in this case really does mean the unlocking of a change that hasn't been unlocked before or advancing or accelerating it. So, for example, overcoming very entrenched barriers. Uh, what are the, the deep limitations that have that have prevented something from adv advancing? That kind of relevance is the kind of relevance that we're talking about. It might be uh, taking a critical funding need or um, a, a different type of, of capacity that's needed, whether it's knowledge, policy, regulation, support, private sector investment, et cetera, and designing something to be relevant to that. Tim will also talk about the arenas of intervention where this relevance can play out. So this, this dimension often is just taken for granted, uh, especially in development finance or you know, climate finance where if it's relevant to climate mitigation or resilience or landscapes, forests, et cetera, then it might be relevant to transformational change. Well, the answer is sometimes and sometimes not. Uh, the other thing I'll point out about this is that relevance, the way we've defined it, really does mean remaining relevant. And how critical is that? It's very critical. So this is not only relevant at the early Sort of investment planning or design stage, but relevant throughout the course and in intervention and beyond, actually. Relevance to changing context and circumstances, relevance to new markets, new technologies, uh, changes in you know, the price of different options for renewable energy, uh, relevance to other actors and influences that are happening simultaneously. So relevance at the beginning may not be relevant after some months or years or longer, uh, not to be forgotten. Uh, and sometimes people do think of it as only an early stage or design stage thing. But we found that many things that might have been relevant to transformational change early on actually may not continue to be as relevant later. Sometimes initiatives or programs simply should be let go of, which is a painful reality when it comes to remaining relevant, but a real one. So this value, the value of relevance is, is clear. Uh, it does often get uh, lack of attention and focus, especially over time. So we do need to clarify that uh, in terms of this dimension, how it could be applied. And we do need to improve the guidance around this and an explanation of what it is and what it isn't. Uh, there may be some case to really expand this dimension or, uh, or you know, otherwise modify it. But this does get to the core of remaining as relevant to the change itself over time that we don't want to forget or take for granted. Uh, next slide. We're going to move to through the four dimensions, reflect on them all, and then pause for some Q&A or see what people would like to offer and reflection themselves. The dimension of systemic change really is just sort of the core and substance of the transformational change that we've been thinking about. 
it is just the fundamental shifts in the structures, the content and the systems functions. So it could be, for example, the depth of uh, a change around uh, clean energy. It is, it is ultimately what creates resilience in resilience in a climate context in um, in food security, in infrastructure security, in recovery uh, from natural disasters. So many examples of that I'm sure you could relate to around the actual core of the change. It's the depth um, that we all want and need for the transformation to actually occur. So this is one that is obvious, although it's not always called systemic change in people's minds or in, in the words used, but that's the intent behind the systemic change dimension. I, I'd like to uh, you know, point out that this is the action of things like removing the barriers, uh, you know, relevance comes in, this is the action, or building capacity, for example, that is a, a systemic change that is a, a stepping stone or foundation upon which other things can then happen all of the results and outcomes that we're talking about when it comes to transformational change, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, saving lives in the face of droughts or extreme weather events, whether it's really reducing greenhouse gas emissions or whether it's really having viable alternative livelihood options for forest dependent communities. Those are the systemic changes that we're talking about. Notably, something can be scaled uh, and still not be systemic. Uh, so there's a relationship between this depth and the scaling dimension, which comes next. This obviously is the heart of, of the transformational change that we were talking about. Um, however, we do really realize this does need some additional clarification and that when you're designing or implementing for change, knowing what the systemic change needs are is very difficult, especially at the outset. As things evolve in complex contexts in particular, the needs uh, for designing and implementing to achieve the systemic change also often evolve, evolve. And the original plans may no longer be relevant or may really need to be revised. So this is another one that needs ongoing attention. It's a very difficult you know, thing to achieve and to project or predict or control. So all of this is noted um, in this framework. Next slide, please. Now we'll talk about scale, which is the most obvious uh, dimension of the four that people you know, hone in on when they think about large systems change. And we are really talking about large systems change in this context of transformational change and climate action. We fully recognize the small scale changes that are fundamental as well at the individual level from people's mindsets to their consumer patterns, to their behaviors, to their actual health and livelihood, even survival. Uh, small scale also includes households and communities uh, and those are fundamental. We have at the same time intentionally defined scale to be large systems change scales if it will reach that scale of transformational change ultimately at the global level. So there's some tension there between where you focus and at what uh, scale and specificity. Um, maybe there's a dialogue there, but we are talking about entire sectors, entire geographies, countries, uh, ultimately regions and global trends. And greenhouse gas emissions, they don't care where they are, right? It's a global, uh, it's a global uh, atmospheric scenario that, you know, affects everybody. So we do need big scale. Uh, same thing uh, with other areas in um, the climate change realm. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, I think the value of this dimension is so obvious that we don't need to go into it anymore. But I will say that there are a lot of areas where we could clarify and advance uh, the interpretation of, of this dimension and how it might be possibly applied. For instance, the way we've thought about scale, it's also beyond the time frame or scope of projects or programs. That's really important because uh, 
projects and programs, as we know, have limited scope and ability to actually affect change. Uh, after they're done, what happens? Who picks them up? Who who modifies them and how? How are they replicated? Is that replication and scaling independent or is it dependent on things like additional you know, grants, subsidies, or other kinds of interventions? That type of scaling uh, consideration is really fundamental to understanding the change that's happening and to tracking it. And uh, most most work that is analyzing scale doesn't actually continue for many years or decades after an intervention is over or necessarily look at different aspects of scale and replication it's usually outside of the scope of most evaluations and analyses to do so so there are many considerations in terms of of scale the last one i'll mention is that uh, across the dimensions uh, both the concepts of speed and acceleration of change. So speed of change and acceleration of change are commonly identified as, as gaps in the current four dimension framework. And we've thought about whether they fit mostly in scale or whether they would fit mostly as a separate dimension perhaps. So that, that, that's worth considering. Next slide, please. Last of the four. Now sustainability, this is, as we've thought about it, uh, the robustness and resilience of a change. So re this recognizes that complex adaptive systems are constantly in flux. They do change outside of, you know, just on their own accord and no one actor or party can really control all of that at the systems level. In the context of climate change, we're dealing with very complex adaptive atmospheric and natural systems on top of complex social and economic systems, and even complicated or complex systems of actors and institutions, uh, different sectors that are interplaying, uh, negotiations, et cetera. It's like a perfect storm of complexity on top of complexity. And sustainability in this context is a very tough bar to hit. We know that things are changing all the time. Um, in the COVID pandemic obviously has changed a lot of things uh, for everyone, including uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other patterns that are very relevant here. Sustainability often is interpreted, uh, especially in international development and finance as something much more narrow about the sustainability of financing, for instance. And the way we thought about this is much broader than that. It has to do with being robust over time. So continuing to be relevant, deep and self-sustaining without artificial supports or reliance on assistance and also resilience. So strong, able to sort of bounce back or bounce beyond following additional shocks or stressors to the system and adaptive in response to, in, in response to changing circumstances over time. So it's a much, it's a very ambitious uh, concept. This dimension is also intuitive and we know that, you know, for something to be real and for change to be real, it does need to be uh, both sustainable and lasting or else it's not real or fully realized. For that reason, we you know, know its importance to stay and to remain a square focus. We've also been discussing and at some level debating this dimension in terms of what it means and what it doesn't, how it could be interpreted. It is actually the hardest dimension to identify. Um, the studies that many people on this webinar conducted in 2018 uh, you know, underscored that uh, knowing whether a change is on its way to sustainability or currently is, is, is extremely difficult, particularly way beyond project scope and boundary and uh, timeframes. We also recognize that uh, the term sustainability is applied and interpreted in many different ways by different actors and sectors. It can be used as sort of an environmentally friendly, uh, you know, label. Um, it can be really interpreted much more in uh, financial and institutional terms. And uh, so we're wrestling with this term and, and the dimension and sort of how to evolve it uh, this year. Next slide. So before we um, open this up, I just wanna step back across this framework of dimensions. 
I've, I've noted, I think, some of the strengths and weaknesses, and each one of these could be a discussion um, on its own for hours or longer. Many of you, I think, have excellent ideas of how to clarify or strengthen them. Perhaps even we should just consider alternative frameworks to this or add other frameworks in. So it's not just this four dimension one that we keep anchoring on through the TCLP's work. Uh, overall, we found that these dimensions are the most used of the frameworks that the TCLP's worked with the most cited and often the most uh, probably practical for making transformational change real. At the same time, we recognize a very high bar in these. In fact, uh, the way we've defined in particular scale and sustainability, this is a, a pretty ambitious set of dimensions, especially if you assume that all four, as we have, all, that all four need to be in place at some level to be considered a package that together is transformational change. Uh, it's it's a you know very possible that we should just retract that that ambition some to be more modest or practical in terms of what a set of efforts initiatives or programs might be able to do, uh, and and how these dimensions could be interpreted in a practical way from uh, you know uh, the perspective of of an institution or a program. I think I'll uh, pause there because I've spoken uh, for many minutes and hand off to. Tim to do, um, you know, a, a few Q&A and, and maybe a, a additional reflections from those of you who've been involved in this work about these dimensions and their utility and their limitations. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, there's been a really rich discussion in the chat. Uh, I want to thank people for weighing in there and encourage you to continue to do so. Um, one thing before I just pause to see if there's some any questions or observations for a few minutes. Um, I am going to post into the chat a link to a Google Doc that we've set up that will be open for the next two weeks uh, to collect input. And we'll be copying information over from the chat to there as well. But feel free to go there and share any observations or ideas you have about improving the framework. Um, that will be feeding into a meeting coming up on the 20th for the CMM group. Yeah, and Tim, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I did mm -hmm. forget something that I really need to, to convey in terms yep. of the limitations and opportunities for clarity. Uh, we fully recognize that there are some values and principles that are not clarified in the dimensions as currently written and articulated that could fit in, but could also be separate. So these include um, equity, uh, the role of a just transition, um, social inclusion, gender aspects, and other things that have to do with both values and principles. One could argue that those fit within relevance and systemic change. However, we are considering whether some of those um, maybe together or in separate ways be added as different dimensions to make sure they're very clear and an integral part of a transformational change framework. So um, I was remiss at not, at not mentioning that, thought I should do that. Thanks. Yes. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, one, one question that's come in or, or a set of thoughts are around how to think about kind of um, smaller scale changes that may be happening at a uh, community level? Um, can we think about those as building blocks to systemic change, or is there another way in incorporating them, given that the definition really talks about large-scale change? And so I don't know if Anna or Nasibe, any brief reflections on that? Uh, I think this relates to the point I was making about um, scale and the relationship between uh, the fundamental role of small, quote, small change, which can, is at all levels, including the individual level, um, all the way up to the larger systemic uh, changes in sectors, regions, and globally. And uh, I think the question is about the value. There's recognition of value of, of change. In, in fact, so much is context specific. So for we have done a lot of work SIF has with um, Zambia and the government of Zambia working at all levels within Zambia, the community level, all the way up to 
national level and the relationship between the two um, being pretty fundamental to change there and uh, the systemic change and the scaling, both small and large scale. That's a good example of uh, the recognition that we have about how change needs to happen um, going forward. I don't know if that answers the question and others are welcome to, to chime in. There's a few more questions that have come in. Um, one is about kind of uh, um, uh, any implications of the uh, for this work around the refreshed DAC evaluation criteria, and I think uh, Neil Bird noted the that the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, mentions paradigm shift, which are different lenses or, or approaches. And just seeing if you guys have any reflections, we'll definitely be capturing that for subsequent discussion. But um, if you have any quick thoughts on that. I can start that and then um, maybe Joe or others would be happy to chime in. I think Per Bosco, I saw his name on the list. He's the chair of the OECD DAC, uh, the committee that was working on revising the DAC criteria. And he's also on the evaluation and learning advisory group. So I would encourage Per to chime in if, um, if the pair I see is the same pair. Uh, we've always considered the DAC criteria and um, have looked you know, into the revisions to the criteria. They are relevant uh, and there's a spirit of some of them that actually does resonate with the spirit of these dimensions. Um, they're, uh, they have a more narrow purpose um, and so we wanna recognize that as well. And then, um, note that we have not done a, a detailed mapping uh, across them, but it's a good thing that we could do more explicitly and then maybe make some, um, you know, communicate around that in a way that can speak more directly to that question. Uh, then I'll just say on the paradigm shift, we've been working closely with GCF for years, considering how paradigm shift is interpreted. Uh, also, uh, you know, it, whether it's synonymous with transformational change and have a few ongoing efforts uh, with GCF um, around that. Uh, I'm happy to let Joe or others respond more to that question. Joe? Oh, looks like you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, great uh, questions and conversation uh, on the DAC criteria again I'd love to hear from pair uh, uh, if he's able to uh, chime in here my, my you know I haven't studied this in depth but uh, when I did look at the revised criteria I found that the interpretation and the guidance around the the new criteria was much stronger in terms of a systems lens and some of these elements of transformational change uh, but at the same time, uh, a lot of people who use and apply the criteria won't read all of that context. And so the, the criteria as they stand may not give the impression of, um, of being strong on, on taking into account these, these transformational change uh, aspects. Um, and then on the scale question, I just wanted to note that uh, sometimes scale is misinterpreted, as Anna mentioned, as an, as an input and, and definitely want to acknowledge that small scale interventions can have huge systemic uh, impacts. And so, uh, you know, we can see small scale interventions being very important that can then uh, have a wider system influence and, um, you know, be adopted by a larger set of actors. At the same time, when we're trying to uh, think about what's truly transformational or not at a systems level, I think some notion of scale is really important, contextually specific, of course, uh, but to see that wider systemic impact um, and the and the scaling of, of influence, I think, is, is key. And then the final thing on the uh, uh, response to thinking about GCF and paradigm shift, um, you know, I've seen uh, from the independent evaluation unit, for example, and some of the things they put out, I think they're thinking similarly uh, uh, as we are on, on these dimensions of transformational change. Um, I believe they had uh, one that was more around depth of change and behavior change uh, seemed to be more prominent there, whereas with ours, I think it's more implicit or, or uh, embedded within uh, the other dimensions. Um, but that could, again, be uh, good fodder for future conversation. 
Great, thanks, Joe. Um, we're gonna turn to the next section, but first, I just wanted to see if, if, if Pear, if you had any uh, quick comments that you wanted to share in response to this discussion. Um, yes, hello. Um, this is Pear speaking, and can you hear me? Great. Um, yes, thanks for bringing this, um, the revised evaluation criteria into the debate. Uh, I think that's highly relevant. As you know, the criteria or the revised criteria um, is the result of a, of a long and wide uh, process. And the criteria themselves uh, or the explanation is, is rather brief and, and and attempts to um, incorporate um, several aspects. Um, as some of you mentioned, um, the, we are now in the process of um, um, developing a guidance to the criteria uh, that will be able to go more into depth uh, to these uh, different um, uh, aspects of the criteria and hopefully uh, include uh, some of uh, the views from this uh, discussion also. So I encourage you to provide inputs. Uh, they have been circulated for comments and, and hopefully they are able to, to be more comprehensive and go deeper into also transformational change aspects. Thanks. Great, thanks for sharing those, those thoughts. Um, I, I know, thanks for also uh, chatting in lots of great uh, reflections and questions and keep those coming. We're going to turn to the next section and lay out a few more of the concepts uh, and then we'll open it up for some discussion before we wrap the call today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to kick off this next section, talk for a few minutes about the arenas of intervention. Um, I think one of the strengths of the uh, TCLP transformational change framework is that it was really rooted or grounded in looking at practical work being conducted on the ground. So back in 2017, when the TCLP was developing these concepts, um, uh, there was actually an effort to look at the actual country programs and projects that the SIP was supporting with, it, with its partners across um, you know, more than 70 countries and more than 300 projects to really try and understand the varied ways in which SIF supported uh, efforts were attempting to advance transformational change. Um, I think one of the areas that arose of interest was um, in looking at those actual design documents for programs and, and projects, we found some patterns that emerged um, around the types of actions that were supported by uh, CIF interventions. And we were able to group those into about nine different categories that you'll see on the screen here that we um, <clears throat> termed the arenas of intervention. We define them as entry points for action to enable or catalyze change, and they include financing, governments and engagement, institutions, knowledge and information, markets, natural capital, policies, practices and mindsets, and technologies and infrastructure. Um, and then it was interesting in thinking about how those were uh, actions in these areas were framed. It was often in support of design to overcome barriers um, and or to support systemic changes or to advance scaling. So there was a clear link to the dimensions that Anna talked about, but these were really areas where actual um, work was being supported through interventions. Um, so in terms of the potential value of thinking about arenas, um, we saw a couple different areas in which they could be helpful. Um, and we fully recognize that each country and program has its own unique context. Um, that was something recurring that came up, but at the same time, we were able to detect some patterns that seem to emerge across similar types of projects, um, which would frequently emphasize specific types of actions across the arenas. There's a few examples on the slide here where, you know, there were clusters of projects that the SIF supported around climate information systems, disaster risk management projects, which seem to activate a certain collection of activities that were supported either through, through technical assistance or financing and then work undertaken within uh, countries 
um, by country governments and partners. Similarly, in the FIP around clusters of market-related market development products for forest products, uh, there was specific uh, actions that were able to uh, cluster in certain areas. And the same thing played out in looking at uh, in the um, SREP program around microgrid and mini grid systems. So this got thinking about, are there certain patterns of it that could at least be helpful from a practitioner perspective of thinking about how one might want to think about different types of structuring or designing of interventions to advance systemic change or to advance scaling, um, recognizing that there's contextual factors that make each project uh, um, unique and different, and whether there might be some guidance uh, or information that could be shared to really help people in that idea of designing for transformational change. It is really important to note that there are some limitations and challenges with these arenas, at least as they've been developed so far. Um, first, we find it difficult to clearly parse some of the activities to avoid overlap in some areas. So, for example, you know, parsing specifically what might fall in the institution's bucket versus knowledge and information versus um, mindsets. Um, we had some pretty precise definitions, but I think it did lead to some confusion um, and, and could benefit from some refined thinking. Um, second, I think we recognize that there's other factors aside from actions across these arenas that may be really important to systemic change and scaling, such as leadership, programmatic approach, project management, and other factors. So I think we want to be careful not to fall in the trap of here's a set of ingredients and you just combine them in the right way and voila, there's transformational change. But this may be an area that would be promising to pursue to at least um, bring down to a more practical level. What do we mean by systemic change and scaling? Um, so uh, with that, um, uh, I'd like to now turn over to uh, Matthew Savage to speak about the um, stages of transformational change and the signals of transformational change. Um, Matt is director at Oxford Consulting Partners and is a leading international expert on climate change, economics, policy, and finance. He has worked in more than 30 countries across five continents, including roles at DFID and International Finance Corporation. And he was a key partner, um, had the pleasure of working with as he led the independent evaluation team conducting the evaluation of transformational change in 2018. So he's been thinking deeply about how to operationalize this transformational change framework. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt. Great. Um, thanks, Tim. Just nod if you can hear me, Tim. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so so I really came into the TCLP process as, as part of the evaluation. And uh, when we arrived, we received the dimensions, which were very useful, classifying um, features for understanding transformation. And we had the arenas, which were the types of activities which the uh, the SIF was involved in. Um, but that only got us so far in terms of thinking about how we were actually going to evaluate transformation within the SIF. Um, and it became quite clear to uh, to us as a team that um, what it didn't do was give us a sense of pathway or process towards transformation, that within these dimensions and arenas, there were staging posts from uh, start towards finish. So there was a sort of temporal process act, uh, aspect. And also that they lack the granularity to answer the question of, well, what actually is transformation in practice? If you're looking at a program or project, how do we get the granularity to know that this is transformation, but this isn't? Um, and, and can we sort of differentiate there? So um, the first aspect in terms of the temporal process part, uh, we, we call the stages of advancement. Um, and this was sort of developed in the context that we're looking at a broad range of programs. So there were, you know, utility scale grid um, programs, small smallholder agriculture resilience programs. And we needed something that could capture how advanced that process of transformation was um, within each of these diverse country contexts or program contexts. Um, so this was quite simple. It's quite a simple framework, but it allowed us essentially to say, um, in terms of the early stages, has the project prepared the ground for transformation, addressed early barriers, identified its windows of opportunities, for example, um, addressed political economy barriers or, or identified champions, 
And this links very closely the early stage to the relevance concept or the relevance dimension. Um, there was then a sort of set of interim uh, outcomes, and these were uh, outcomes where we saw processes of change underway beyond the projects or the programs themselves. Um, these were uh, policy processes, financing processes, market development processes. They weren't yet uh, sufficiently developed to be able to say that the market has been transformed or the new policy is operational, but it was an indication that something was underway which uh, at least gave a chance of these transformational outcomes uh, occurring. And then in terms of the advanced uh, stage, uh, really here we were saying that there is a, a goal or an endpoint to which the transformational process leads. And that might be a uh, an interim um, sort of, uh, staging post towards a longer term societal or environmental change. Um, or it might be a, a full scale disruptive paradigm shift, for example, in terms of a technology or, or a market. It could be either of those. So uh, this allowed us within the evaluation, I think within the TCLP more broadly, to start um, classifying transformation as a, as a process and examining it as a process or a set of pathways uh, towards transformation. And also to start giving credit for those early and interim pieces, which might not otherwise get the credit that they deserve. So if you're asked to look at transformational change in a program like the SIF, the natural tendency is to see, you know, has a, has a country gone 100% renewable or has a country uh, become completely resilient to the, to the impacts of tropical cyclones uh, on the back of a, a SIF program or a GCF program? Um, what that doesn't do is capture the, the momentum and the staging posts towards transformation, which are the bread and butter of, uh, of, of programming and program implementation. So it, uh, it, it created a balance in terms of the sorts of things we were, uh, we were looking for. Um, it's, it's not perfect, of course. Um, we recognize that it, it's, it's a fairly linear process uh, and obviously transformation is a much more dynamic and, and can be a much more chaotic uh, process, a much more disruptive process. Um, it doesn't capture the connectivity between different uh, types of system change. Um, often the signals that are captured tend to be around the early and interim stages. Um, so it's quite rare during a program evaluation cycle to actually see strong advanced signals. They, they do occur, um, but usually not, not before sort of you know, at least three to five years uh, post program commencement. Uh, and it doesn't capture any of the barriers that can get in the way, such as um, technologist disruption or political disruption or, or COVID that might uh, cause a little bit of backsliding from one stage to the next. Um, if we go through to the next slide, um, the, this is sort of this was the answer to the second part of the conundrum, which was how will we know transformation when we see it? Um, and this is uh, this was sort of the conversation we had with a lot of people when we, we said, well, what is transformation? How how do you define it? And they would say, well, I, I sort of know transformation when I see it, but I can't really give you a, a watertight definition. Um, and as as a response to that, we we sort of thought about the idea of trying to create these indicators of, of transformation, um, but very quickly got to a point of understanding that different systems and country contexts and, and sectors would have very different types of uh, progress towards transformation. And it would be unfair to create objective benchmarks, essentially, or indicators against which to judge uh, different programs operating across different, different contexts. So we came up with the concepts of, of, of signals. Um, and signals were really um, markers of progress. So where were we on that journey towards transformation through the dimensions, through the arenas, through the stages of, uh, of transformation? How would, we, how would we know? How would we recognize where we were on that journey and in what, uh, in, in what um, sort of dimension or, or arena we'd be operating? So uh, we started to build out a set of signals for, for each of the, the SIF programs, um, energy access, uh, power, power generation, or low carbon development, uh, resilience, and, and forestry. Um, 
And some of these signals were common to all of the programs, so around capacity development, for example, or policy uh, policy development. But others differed quite substantially between uh, between the programs. And there is a uh, there is an argument here that you can't create um, full lists of indicators that are going to please every or fit every program or uh, every uh, every climate fund. So the approach has been much more to create indicative types of signals which people can look at, review, and then um, uh, sort of align their own thinking about what the transformational process might be and how it might be recognized. So um, on the positive side, I think signals provide a sort of sufficient level of flexibility to deal with complexity within climate programming. Um, and it does help create a level of simplicity and practicality, which links from these quite heady conversations around transformation through to the practical nature of designing programs, building results frameworks, doing evaluation and monitoring work. Um, so it, it, it sort of provides a link between the two. Uh, but there are a number of difficulties, obviously. So some signals are easier to measure or monitor or capture than others, uh, where there's data available. It's often difficult to know where a signal will sit between scale or sustainability, for example. Um, and in general, they, you know, there's, there is a, it can be a trade-off between the static nature of the signal and the dynamic nature of the change that you're trying to describe. So there is a, necessarily a trade-off there. So I'll leave it at there at that, Tim. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, I wanted to just uh, uh, really quickly just reference um, two other kind of concepts or frameworks that the TCLP developed, which were pretty uniquely focused on the SIF, but do speak to that kind of interest or desire that Anna referenced earlier about trying to connect these individual concepts in a way that kind of helps understand how transformational change might happen. So the first here is a, a detailed graphic, uh, happy to share it uh, after, don't feel the need to digest it now, but it was an initial attempt to try and uh, graphically capture how some of these dimensions and arenas come together in the context of SIF intervent supported interventions to really foster transformational change. Um, one thing I wanted to note was uh, there's two big boxes around this diagram. One says complex dynamic context, political economy, and current development pathways. <clears throat> and the other uh, focuses on uh, interactive uh, processes and activities that may be supported by others beyond the SIF. So I think it recognizes but doesn't fully really get into this uh, situ the, you know, the fact that these interventions, which may be very sector focused, are situated in a much broader context of dynamic complexity um, in, in nested systems, which I think is an or important aspect to think about in the concept of transformational change. The one other tool I'll briefly reference uh, is that the, as part of the evaluation effort, um, the ITAD team developed, working with the TCLP, developed a set of uh, um, uh, hypotheses to um, <clears throat> put forth thoughts about how the SIF supports progress toward transformational change, and then those were used for evaluation against. So those are some other things just to be aware of that were developed, but are pretty SIF specifically focused. What I'd like to do now is actually shift and open it up for uh, questions <clears throat> for about the next uh, 14 minutes or so, and reflections and discussions. There's been a really rich uh, um, dialogue going on in the chat. <clears throat> I will also repost the link to the Google Doc, um, which I referenced earlier in the call, and we encourage ongoing input there. Um, but I did want to create some space here, maybe first to see if any of the um, other speakers or the uh, participants in the TCLP process that helped develop these concepts back in 2017 and 2018 have any quick observations of things that you'd like to add to the discussion here, and then we can open it up for questions and observations from others on the call. So anybody from the... Um, speaker team today for the webinar or who was involved in the uh, uh, TCLP process want to chime in and either raise your hand or, or just come on in right now.
<clears throat> I see a couple people on the line who have been involved in the process. Um, anybody want to get in before I open it up? Okay. It's um, um, just, uh, I mean, great. I, I Go ahead. Man. One thing, which is, I mean, at the moment we have we have these four, if not five, four or five different concepts. Um, the dimensions, the arenas, the stages, the signals, um, and potentially some hypotheses type uh, uh, specific to, to individual programs. Um, my own sense is that a lot of these speak to each other um, in a way that needs better integration or closer integration. Um, and I think there'd be some value in trying to package these into a, a sort of more integrated, easier to uh, easy, easier to handle set of concepts. Right. And Anna? I'll just, just echo what Matt said. I agree. Uh, I also uh, think we need to be very clear about not only <clears throat> what's meant by these frameworks, but how to use them and not use them because they can set up um, false expectations if used directly, for example, as investment criteria or design criteria or criteria <laughs> for reporting. Um, there's a potential of, of actually, you know, having sort of a perverse outcome that we don't intend uh, by setting up expectations for sustainability and scaling, for example, when that's not realistic. Um, and, you know, things that, are potentially transformative also require taking risks and being committed. <clears throat> and then those don't always work out uh, for good reason, you know, for reasons that um, all have to do with experimentation and trying things for the first time, and also for reasons that the world continues to change. So um, energy markets are sort of the easiest one to identify there that just in the past 10 years, uh, the price, uh, of certain uh, renewable technologies and you know price per uh, you know kilowatt gigawatt hour of, of energy has plummeted in ways that are really great but that makes other alternative competing technologies um, less affordable or attractive uh, we may need to let go of things that might have been transformative 10 years ago five years ago uh, and to make that clear as well in terms of interpretation of not just these frameworks, but of uh, the type of investments and programs and efforts that really will have to continue to be relevant and nimble. Um, so there are a whole bunch of things that I think um, we want to be cautious about. And as a TCLP, as a partnership, really in, invite others to share their thoughts on this as well. Um, I just want to chime in, sorry, uh, following up on one, what Anna said, because, you know, part of the process uh, for us as recipient countries was actually to, to get some, some guidelines or documents to see what transformational change looked and how to, you know, like search or go in search for it. And one thing that I personally learned throughout this whole process is that context matters so much because transformation can look so different according to you know different scales and different countries and drawing up a little bit on on, on what anna said before also about how something can be small scale in investment but its impact can actually trigger a bigger scale uh you know in the aftermath so to speak so uh I think it's also cautious to to think about how are the the, the initial conditions of you know any country <sighs> and how to adapt this in in the best way. Thanks, Nasibe. Um, in looking through the chat, there was an interesting line of inquiry or, or and comments around in in the SIF context and taking kind of a sector focused approach like renewable energy or forest improvement or um, uh, climate resilience initiatives is that um, 
whether that's kind of inherently limiting from a transformational perspective. And so I'm just curious if you know, any of the speaker team has thoughts on that. I know that there's been efforts that might be worth mentioning around development impacts or trying to think about the broader context or, or benefits. But if you have any thoughts around, um, you know, whether the scope, uh, you know, limits the ability to really think about transformational change or, or how to think about that relationship. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in uh, just briefly on that. I, mean, I think there is, it, it is true, I think within the work that we did on the evaluation, we were bounded at the sector level to a great extent and we didn't, we did look at co-benefits um, in terms of employment or um, sort of other sort of social environmental outcomes uh, associated with the SIF, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a core focus. And th there may be some room, I think, by I don't know if you call it equity or if you call it you know, what you call it, but the um, societal developmental implications of what you are doing beyond the climate sphere and how it links into those, uh, I think could be and should, should be an explicit uh, an explicit part of what gets looked at without diverting attention. And it's always a matter of resources in terms of how much of the world you want to throw your arms around. Um, but certainly the linkages, and especially now with COVID, uh, what I can see all, all climate finance is now essentially focused on, on green recovery and just transition and social aspects as well. So it's an opportune moment I think, to push that agenda. Thanks, Matt. Anyone else from the speaker team want to share thoughts around that? Otherwise, I think we do have some hands raised. Okay, um, it looks like uh, Scott Chaplow um, wanted to share a question or thought. Scott? Thanks, can people hear me? Maybe yep. Raise your hand. Good. Yeah, um, basically, I think I wanted to just take a look at sustainability because I think that's kind of SIF. I mean, SIF is an organization that couples natural and human systems. And um, the whole transformation coming into the showcase, the most recent buzzword on the development dictionary, is, is largely premised on the interconnectedness, the magnitude of change, and the urgency. 20, the 2030 agenda captures that. Um, the sustainability has been pretty much watered down since it's broken in the late 90s. Um, it's been watered down to just continue, continue, continuity continuity or continuing intended results. The, the 91 DAC criteria definition is measuring whether the benefits of an activity are likely to continue after global warming has been withdrawn. And that's how a lot of business as usual is happening. Whether those activities have a negative multiplier effect on the larger system isn't really encompassed by that definition. And the 2019 definition for DAC criteria the extent to which the net benefits of the intervention to continue doesn't really do much better. We need to go beyond the intended results because the continuation of intended results sidesteps the re relevance of whether or not best in the long run for the wider human and natural ecosystems that we need to sustain. And I think the, the SIF definition of sustainability can go beyond continuity of robustness and resilience to include, uh, expand the domain of validation and value to encompass those wider, longer systemic impacts on human natural systems. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I think it's, it's a real important shift of Great, thanks, Scott. And I, I will also add that there was a recent uh, uh, CMM or concepts, metrics, methods, and metrics uh, interest group call that focused specifically on sustainability, where these concepts were explored, and have a summary of that call going out soon. And I think it'll be an important area for um, for the TCLP process to wrestle with. Um, I did want to flag uh, um, some really interesting comments and questions about that relate to measuring transformational change. Um, 
and uh, also the the importance of thinking about stakeholders at the center of that process of uh, of evaluating or assessing um, change uh, since perceptions of stakeholders in and of themselves is a really important indicator of change um, uh, and just wanted to see if any of the speakers have any quick thoughts you'd like to share about um, uh, you know, kind of aware this TCLP framework um, is situated for its ability to kind of help think about kind of how to measure transformational change or the role of uh, stakeholders in that. And if people could please put themselves on mute, if not um, trying to speak, that'd be great. Um, anybody on the speaker team want to? speak to the uh, measurement metrics? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. Um, I think it's very hard if you're doing comparative measurement. So if you're stacking up one program against another or one sector against another, then it becomes quite problematic. But I, but I think if you're looking at a fairly targeted um, intervention where you know what you're trying to achieve, um, then it is possible to create proxy measures of transformation, and that might be to do with technology deployment or uh, affordability or number of market players, or you, you, you can start to, to sort of capture some of those bigger scale system or scaling uh, aspects. Um, and also sustainability aspects around um, whether something becomes self-financing or competitive with other technologies. Um, so those are possible. And I, I sort of I, I would point people towards the signals of transformational change publication, which the SIF put out, in the back of which there are some examples about how you might actually start to do that. The sorts of sorts of signals that you might uh, might think about. And this is Tim. I will add that the, that'll be a, an area of inquiry. I think over the coming months here for the TCLP interest groups is really you know, reflecting more on on both the signals and 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 metrics as well around transformational change. Um, in a minute, I'm going to hand it over to Regan to um, wrap us up since we're approaching the end here, but just wanted to create some space to see if anyone else from the um, uh, speaker team has any kind of last thoughts you'd like to share about the concepts and framework. Thanks. I'll just add, and it's partially in response to the last just discussion on measurement that this framework um, does go far beyond uh, the scope and role of interventions. It really does look at, in the interim and advanced stages in particular, things that are outside, that are replicating or sustaining independently. It really changes the measurement question and challenge. Uh, it's actually so ambitious that it'd be, it's, hard, it's hard for anyone to fully assess and have the time or data to do so. The other thing I'll mention is that even with um, with really strong indicators, for example, of greenhouse gas reductions, uh, emission reductions, uh, we're not at all losing sight of the social um, equity and sort of uh, social justice aspects of, of any of the any of this work, um, and that that is square um, not only in our minds but must be in what we think of and assess going forward. So I'll leave it at that. Great. Anyone else from the speaker team? Great. Well, I'd just like to, um, before turning it over to Regan here, thank everyone for really a, a lively and robust uh, chat that's been going on. We'll definitely be making sure we capture those and feed those over into the upcoming CMM discussion. I encourage people to continue to add any thoughts you may have to the Google Doc that we sent a link out to, which we'll also include in a follow-up email uh, to this webinar, and hope that this has been uh, helpful in really presenting the, the great work of the TCLP in developing a transformational change framework over the last um, few years and just really put that call out there that we've got this great window of opportunity to really um, refine, enhance, clarify aspects of it uh, over the coming months, as well as to think about its diffusion and use um, and its compatibility and alignment with 
um, many other useful concepts and frameworks that are, are being developed or have been developed out there. So thank you for joining this uh, really exciting and important discussion. And with that, I'd like to turn it over back to Regan uh, to just wrap us up with a, a reminder on a few um, upcoming TCLP uh, activities. Thanks, Tim. Um, thank you all again for joining us. This was a great uh, beginning to the discussion of how we can continue to advance um, and enhance the frameworks that SIF uses regarding transformational change and also um, you know, support the work of other climate finance um, institutions and organizations. If you're interested in continuing this conversation, which we hope you will, um, we've highlighted the transformational change concepts, methods, and met metrics interest group meeting, which will be really a, a time to uh, extend the discussion that we started today. Um, additional interest groups are also meeting soon uh, with landscapes meeting tomorrow morning. Um, if you are interested in joining any of our interest groups, please do reach out. Um, and yes, we, we appreciate your input. Um, please do continue to use the Google Doc to um, provide your thoughts about these frameworks. Um, with that, I will just say thank you again. Um, Anna, any last words before I unmute people for people to say goodbye? <laughs> Thanks, Regan. Um, just that uh, we're excited to have Robin Barr, who's on this webinar today, the uh, speaker for our September TCLP webinar. Um, she's with the Earthworm Foundation, which I think used to be called the Forest Trust, and works with private sector companies, many of them international conglomerates and um, on value chains and uh, has some deep, deep experience working not only with private sector, but with local stakeholders in um, many countries. So we're excited to have that, that um, uh, Robin speaking and some of the wisdom from that work and insights that complement many of those that uh, we've been, we have working with multilaterals and with different kind of financing instruments. Uh, so we'll be announcing the date uh, on that soon. Um, and otherwise, I'd just like to really thank everybody who's joined today and uh, the speakers in particular for taking the time uh, to do this. This is a webinar we anticipate will be referred to uh, over the next several months as people try to understand what we've done and then help to contribute to advancing it. This global work really is important. Uh, the work that many of you are doing is as important and we look forward to collaborating with you further uh, to advance our sort of common not only knowledge and, and understanding but our, our collective uh, impact and uh, the change that we all want. Last thing I'll just say is that uh, we're still in an unprecedented time this year and just to acknowledge that for um, all of you who are affected and uh, you know all of us collectively to get through this this time together. And I think that's it for me.